Hello, welcome to the United Nations University. My name is John DeBoer. I'm Senior Policy Advisor at the Center for Pol Policy Research here at United Nations University. And I'm pleased to introduce you to Rohinton Medora. Welcome, Rohinton. Thank you, John. Rohinton uh, is the president of the Center for International Governance Innovation at Waterloo, Canada. Previous to that, he was the vice president of programs at Canada's International Development Research Center, another institute funding research for development. Not only have you led important uh, development institutions, but you're also a leading thinker uh, in the field. You've published a number of books focused on financial reform uh, and competition in developing countries. And most recently, Roe Hinton also co-published uh, a book on international development, ideas, experiences, and thinking with uh, our own rector, the United Nations University, David Malone, um, which came out from Oxford University Press last year. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for joining us uh, for this conversation series. Um, today, the theme of our conversation is think tanks, what are they good for? A very provocative and interesting theme, and I thought I'd start there in terms of our conversation. What indeed are think tanks good for? Um, most recently, there's been some controversy, at least, uh, around think tanks. I can recall a, a New York Times article which came out last year, which talked about a number of uh, prominent U.S.-based think tanks uh, and perhaps categorize them as influence peddling uh, for a number of foreign countries. Uh, in some cases, many talk about think tanks as having ideological uh, agendas, partisan agendas. But over to you, what, what are think tanks good for? Um, actually, they're good for influence peddling um, <laughs> in the best sense of the term. So the way I'd put it, John, is that um, think of a spectrum. And the spectrum would go from basic or fundamental research to more applied forms of research to uh, the application of that research and therefore influencing either people's decisions or people's behavior. And at some point that includes policy change uh, and structural shift of that kind. Mm -hmm. Think tanks inhabit, in my view, that latter 60% or so of that spectrum. So think tanks rarely do basic fundamental research. What they do is they marshal the research that is either out there uh, or think it through differently, package it, mm -hmm. and then come up with proposals that they move into the public policy domain and into the marketplace of mm -hmm. ideas. Therefore, think tanks are in the business of influencing. Mm -hmm. Now, who they influence, why they influence, how they influence, can be questioned. Mm. And I have no doubt that there are good actors and bad, bad actors and there's good practice and bad. Uh, intuitively, I don't think there's anything wrong, uh, at least my think tank brethren would say there's nothing wrong with being known to have a point of view. Uh, I would think the litmus test here isn't whether you're right or left or, or liberal or, or not, mm. but are you proposing evidence-based right. uh, discussion? Uh, and that is the way uh, a good think tank, in my view, would operate. Mm. Now, you've had a, a long history of supporting, being involved in think tanks. Uh, one of perhaps the most emblematic uh, associations you've had has been with the Think Tank Initiative, mm. uh, which is managed by the International Development Research Center, but funded by numerous donors. Um, and that initiative itself is, is actually quite large in terms of scale, funding over 50 hmm. think tanks in the Global South primarily. Can you tell us a little bit about, about the genesis behind that, uh, that initiative? Also, the vision. Uh, why is it important to support think tanks, particularly in the Global South? Yeah. So, so you mentioned my former employer, right. the International Development Research Center, which in fact David Malone headed for mm -hmm. a number of years and, and, and where you hail from uh, That's right. as well. Uh, um, the IDRC was created about 43 years ago with the purpose of building institutional and research capacity in developing countries uh, and, and creating uh, the basis or helping create the basis on which good policy and good public discussion mm -hmm. is made. And so, um, 
Ever since I joined IDRC in 1992, I had been associated with think tanks in one capacity or the other. And one thing we noticed then was that um, it's easy for funders to go in, fund a project, and leave. Mm -hmm. And then the question becomes, but especially in strained environments and in resource poor environments, who is it that's actually funding, if not the bricks and mortar, the ongoing costs of having a credible, strong mm -hmm. institution that can take on projects? And so core support, which used to be possible in the 50s and 60s and had kind of withered away mm -hmm. for a number of reasons, became a bit of a preoccupation. Mm -hmm. And so IDRC had a number of smaller initiatives. Uh, I can think of one uh, for economics think tanks in West Africa called CICERA, mm -hmm. which was the precursor and therefore put us back on the map along with the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation and, and Swedish SAREC, uh, you know, the grand old funding organizations yeah. for these kinds of things. And so in about 2010 or 2011, I guess, um, the Hewlett Foundation um, when they had a similar idea and did their homework, um, quickly realized that IDRC was the kind of mm -hmm. institution with whom to partner. To make a long story short, yeah. um, IDRC, the Hewlett Foundation, the Gates Foundation, and soon thereafter, DFID, the Dutch, um, pooled resources, which is both money and ideas, to create, as you said, this $50 million in, uh, um, initiative whose aim was not to create new institutions, because sometimes there are very good old institutions that get sidelined mm -hmm. by this need to somehow always do something new and sexy, and that's not always a good thing. Um, and so the aim of the initiative was to fund, to provide up to one-third core support of an institution's budget, and ask the question, if your budget went up by X, what would you do with that money? How would you know what success is? And based on that criteria, about 54 or so institutions were funded in, in a couple of dozen countries. Mm. Um, the final piece in that puzzle was long-term support. Mm. Uh, so the initial grant was for five years. There was a second phase to the initiative that has just begun where about 43 institutions have been uh, in fact funded. Not all the same, but many the same. And the idea is to revitalize that notion of the think tank, uh, in, in this case in developing countries, so that we have the same basis and discussion that we take for granted in developed countries. Mm -hmm. And so that was the aim of the initiative, right. was to create that culture of evidence-based policy discussion and influence. Mm. Now success is hard to come by. Your current institution, the Center for International Governance Innovation, CG, is an independent, nonpartisan think tank. And it was only established about 14 years ago, 2001, mm -hmm. if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. And yet success came quite early in many forms. Uh, one of your, your most touted successes relate to the G20, uh, where you successfully planted ideas and perhaps even shepherded uh, the G20 idea from a minister's forum to a leader's forum. What, what were the, the keys to success? I mean, if you were to describe uh, the conditions for success in terms of moving an idea into reality, what would they be? That's a good example because it also demonstrates the limits of success for any individual organization. So I would begin, mm -hmm. uh, much as I, I, I totally agree with, with the way you describe things, by saying no single institution, uh, and certainly not CG, can claim ownership of the G20 idea coming to fruition. But the way I would put it is you need a good idea, you need good actors, and you need timing, i.e. some form of luck. And so the early years of CG coincided with um, the whole notion of the CG having, having been created to address gaps in global governance. Mm -hmm. This tied in with the time when then finance minister in Canada, ultimately Prime Minister Paul Martin, was mulling over his thinking on how can the world move beyond its G7, G8 basis to account for the emerging uh, market economies coming on board. And so there was a series of discussions that we held around the world on almost a simulation, almost like a UN right. model parliament thing, is if the G20 existed and had to deal with 
I don't know, trade and agriculture, mm -hmm. fisheries, uh, finance, science and technology, how would they do it? And that created that socialization of the concept and mm -hmm. more and more organizations joined and also that coincided with others um, having similar thoughts around the world. Um, that in, it, in and of itself would not have resulted in success. Mm -hmm. To be perfectly honest, the ultimate success happened because of the crisis in 2008 right. okay. when we quickly realized that to resolve this crisis we needed a new forum and that forum was the G20 mm -hmm. as you said, 19 countries at the leaders level. Mm -hmm. So attribution is a key here. I think it's important for groundwork to be done for something to work, but the groundwork is laid by many people mm -hmm. and ultimately when something happens, it's often because of events, dear boy events. Timing, building alliances, yeah. uh, good ideas, those are the key elements. But nurturing and shepherding that, hmm. the point you made, does require institutional capacity and Absolutely. I think CG uh, should be proud of that. Hmm. So, I mean, a lot of the challenges that you're dealing with today, um, particularly that CG is, is taking under its wing, are very complex, whether it be related to uh, internet governance, uh, climate change, uh, violence, changing nature of violence, for example. None of these have, have silver bullets. Um, it's very difficult to, to come forward with, a, with an idea that works in every single context. Um, in, in this milieu, in this new world where, where we have extremely difficult problems, what do you think are, are some of the, the the essential elements uh, to actually make sure that, that we tackle these, these conflicts or these, these issues effectively. What do, do good think tanks do in order to actually make progress mm. uh, in addressing some of these pressing challenges? It depends on the issue too. Mm. So I'll, I'll give you two quick examples. The internet governance and sovereign debt management. In the case of internet governance, uh, Unlike some areas, and I'd argue finance is among them, where there's mm. too many institutions right. competing to manage. In the internet, the fact is there isn't enough governance uh, and, and yeah. you don't have this. It's a brand, I mean, the internet barely existed sure. 20 years ago. And so the scope there is to say what kind of regime do we put in place to balance the social, cultural, economic, and security dimensions of the internet. I would say in this case, uh, the uh, Internet Governance Commission that CG and Chatham House have struck isn't going to come up with a single proposal. What they would come up with, if I had to guess, because mm. the Commission is still doing its work, is some kind of framework. Mm. What are the key issues? What are the risks to look out for? And what are the parameters within which ways forward lie? On something like sovereign debt, uh, the issue is, I wouldn't say more straightforward, but it's more easier to understand. Nationally, we have a Chapter 11 for bankruptcy protection that allows you to take a risk, perhaps fail, reorganize, and move on. Globally, as we know, there isn't that. And so CG's work here is to come up with a specific proposal or two uh, on how we can create a multilateral regime that has an orderly workout of sovereign debt so that crises are not dealt with as they are currently in this quite ad hoc way. And so there, the way we go about doing it and the actors mm -hmm. with whom we play are different. Uh, we have a specific set of proposals that are already being discussed and ultimately, uh, whether they work or not, mm -hmm. isn't entirely in our own right. hands. But we should convince ourselves that what we've done is sound, right. has the right hearing, and that is being promoted back to your first question about influence peddling that we're peddling the influence the right way. Excellent. Perhaps one last question. We are in Japan, in Asia. Uh, many have looked at think tanks as really a, a Western creation, a Western phenomenon. I mean, if you go back to the history of think tanks, uh, the first one, I believe, was in the UK, uh, back in the late 1800s, RUSI, uh, the Royal United Service Institute, and then Brookings Institute was, institution was, was created shortly after Carnegie Endowment. The majority of think tanks, especially nonpartisan, independent think tanks, are based in the West, in, in the United States, Canada, and the UK. What about Asia? 
or the rest of the world. Why haven't think tanks taken off? Mm. Um, what explains uh, that fact? Well, there are, depending on how you count, mm. something like 4,000 to 4,500 think tanks globally. So they have taken off. Okay. Are they all the same creatures is a fair question, and, and the fact is they aren't. By the way, you said Western. I'd go a step further and say Anglophone Western. Um, when IDRC, uh, being a Canadian organization and therefore officially bilingual, created the Think Tank Initiative, we were looking for a French translation for Think Tank. And after studying the subject long and hard, we ended up calling them Le Think Tank. <laughs> so, you know, even in the French culture, there was not an equivalent and somehow there was not some organic word that would describe what the think tank is. So that's a fair point. Um, I suppose a trite answer would be that Western countries, to the extent that they're more democratic than the rest mm -hmm. of the world, there is this sense of debate and discussion which naturally leads to a demand for these kinds of organizations. Um, I suspect it also has to do, uh, at least in developing countries, with the funding issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned the Royal yeah. Institute, you mentioned Brookings. These were all created by either royal endowment or private mm -hmm. philanthropy. And in many countries, that doesn't exist or barely exists. As it be begins to become mm -hmm. more institutionalized, we are seeing think tanks arise around the world. And so I would say the wave is spreading. Mm -hmm. The culture is most embedded in the U.S. and the U.K. and Canada to, to some extent. Uh, if we're having this conversation even 10 years from mm -hmm. now, my guess is that we will see more in India from where I just came uh, two days ago, uh, thrives with self-standing research institutions, which is essentially what think tanks are, self-standing policy-oriented research institutions. But you need that argumentative Indian, argumentative American right. uh, culture within which, and then you need the resources. Mm. And that, I think, is spreading. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us in this conversation theory series, and also you to the audience. Thank you.